it seems like, I don't know if this is true, but is Alzheimer's and dementia on the rise? Oh, yes. Yeah, it is. In fact, it went from not being even on the radar to being a top 10 killer. Um, now, it's interesting how people even die from Alzheimer's disease. It's a very kind of vague death. But yeah, Alzheimer's disease is one of the top 10 diseases now, um, certainly in the West. Um, and, and I would argue it's because it has a metabolic origin. Now, one of the interesting things about Alzheimer's disease is we have spent billions of dollars on Alzheimer's research trying to identify the, the plaque. So, so just to set the stage here so that people listening can appreciate this, this paradigm shift that's occurred in Alzheimer's research. Originally, and even in many people still, people thought that Alzheimer's disease is the result of these plaques accumulating in the brain. These kind of little proteinaceous, little thick things that are preventing neurons from sending the signals throughout the brain for the brain to think and, and, and have normal cognition. And, and yet there are those of us, and I'm proud to say I have long been one of them, who has said that the plaque-based theory doesn't make sense. We have had drugs that have been available for human use for years that have effectively reduced plaques in the brain and yet did nothing to improve cognition. So that is an immediate challenge of the plaque-based theory of Alzheimer's. Even further, even beyond older than that evidence, when you would look post-mortem or look at tissue donor people who'd passed away, you would look at the brains of people who died with confirmed Alzheimer's disease at the time of death and look at the brain of someone who died without any evidence of any cognitive decline or any compromised thinking whatsoever. And you would be just as likely to find plaques in both brains. So, the, so whether the brain had Alzheimer's disease or not, you would still see plaques in the brain. So the whole idea that plaques mattered has long been controversial. And just to put a fine point on it before transitioning to the metabolic origins, about two or three years ago, they found out that the very first published papers that implicated plaque as a cause of Alzheimer's disease were based on fabricated data. So the scientists who published those first reports that led to the entire theory that Alzheimer's disease is plaque-based were called out as fraudulent. And, and indeed, all of it was fabricated. So the entire idea that Alzheimer's, and, and we have spent billions of dollars on studies to try to how, determine how do plaques cause, all, cause Alzheimer's disease? Why, when we reduce plaques, it doesn't appear to help the disease? Because the plaques had nothing to do with it. That's just something that some brains have. Some brains have more of these little specks than other brains, and they don't contribute to Alzheimer's disease at all. Now, what did, what kept rising to the top, and I would hope now is the dominant theory, is that people with Alzheimer's disease almost always have some detectable instance of insulin resistance, if not full-on diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Now, I will say personally, I don't like the term type 3 diabetes because it makes it sound like it's a whole new version of diabetes. To say it more succinctly and accurately, it is simply insulin resistance of the brain. And the brain is a very hungry organ. It is in what I teach as a, a, tri a trinity of high metabolic rate organs, that there are three organs in the body whose metabolic rate is so high that it just really sets it apart from everything else. And the brain is one of them. The brain has a very high metabolic rate. So this is a very hungry organ that needs a lot of energy all the time. But the brain is unique in that it primarily will only use two fuel sources, and I've mentioned them, namely glucose and ketones. <clears throat> but glucose, in that section of the brain that gets compromised with Alzheimer's disease, the glucose can't just come straight in. It needs someone to open the door for it, and that is insulin, of course, just like we described with the muscle cell, where in order for the glucose to go into the muscle, insulin had to come and knock on the door, if you will. And then the muscle, being a polite, responsive host, would open and allow the glucose to come in. The brain is similar, that in that section of the brain, it has doors that need insulin. It's locked until insulin comes and opens them. So even though glucose levels may be high in the blood, like in type 2 diabetes, you would think, well, the brain can just get all the glucose it wants, and yet it cannot because it has insulin regulating the entrance of the glucose. And if the brain is insulin resistant, there's not enough glucose coming in. And thus the brain is forced to rely on the only other fuel that it can rely on, namely ketones. But 
The same person who's eating all the time to keep their blood glucose high all the time has so much insulin in their blood that they're never making enough ketones to fill the gap. You know, and mind the gap. And the brain has an energy gap now in, in, where, where the brain needs, you know, an amount of energy. I'm kind of acting it out for those that are watching. But the brain has a certain energy demand that it needs. And if there's a lot of glucose in a healthy insulin-sensitive person, glucose will fill all of that need. But as the brain becomes progressively insulin resistant, it cannot get all of its energy from glucose. And thus there's an energetic gap. And in the absence of ketones, there's nothing to fill that gap. And the brain says, well, I don't have enough energy to keep functioning as well as I did before. So I have to reduce my function, which manifests as a reduction in the ability to think and process. In other words, cognition goes down. But what's so interesting is I just got finished describing a scenario that scientists refer to as brain glucose hypometabolism, or a reduction in the amount of glucose the brain is using. There are scientists that measured this. We don't in my lab because we don't do these kinds of techniques, but you can actually infuse people with the glucose that you can take pictures of and see how much the brain is taking it in and metabolizing it. In Alzheimer's disease, the brain is not getting as much glucose. So they call that a hypo or a reduction in metabolism of glucose. And as much as you and I are describing that scenario as relevant for Alzheimer's disease, you can essentially open up the book of neurological disorders and see the same thing. Depression has a brain glucose hypometabolism to it. Migraines have a brain glucose hypometabolism. Epilepsy um, and Parkinson's disease. So all of these disorders of the brain, of the central nervous system, the one thing they all have in common is the brain isn't getting enough energy from glucose. And another way of saying that is the one thing all of those seemingly unrelated brain problems have in common is that they all have some degree of insulin resistance. But then it's no surprise that they all benefit when ketones can swoop in to save the day. Um, but that only can happen if the person is giving their body a break from the insulin long enough to actually start making ketones. Exact percentages vary, but one example is a study in the Journal of Neurology in 2011 that found insulin resistance at approximately 40% of individuals with Alzheimer's. Um, but another study uh, in Alzheimer's patients sometimes found it to be as high as 70 or 80%. For instance, research by Dr. Suzanne Dilamonte. Mm -hmm at Brown University has drawn attention to the concept of type 3 diabetes. Yeah, again, I don't love the term, but I appreciate the use of it, which is, it does suggest a metabolic origin. But even, you look at those ranges, Stephen, you'd say, well, one was 40, one was 80. Boy, what a difference. I suspect a lot of that is just how did they measure insulin resistance? Right. If they were looking at the glucose, like so many do, you're just going to miss a lot of people. Yeah, it's quite hard to... It's I think there's different criteria, right, for how one defines someone as insulin resistant. Well, they, yeah, and that's just, that's right. That's because there's not enough training, which is at the beginning of the conversation, you asked my mission. One of my missions is to help people learn what to look for. What do they need to be looking for? Yeah, they need to be looking at insulin. So... Is that easy to measure? Well, it is technically easy to measure. It's just that we have, we don't have enough systems in place to allow it, uh, to enable it. Like, again, um, if if someone listening in the UK were to go to their GP and say, can you measure my insulin? In many instances, they literally can't get it done. The system just isn't in place to take it to the lab and, and measure it. Now, some do. I know some physicians in the UK who do so, and they have developed their own way of getting it done. And they're incredible advocates of this whole idea. But it is harder in the UK and in Canada um, where the system is such that they have said, out of ignorance, but perhaps well-placed or, or well-intentioned, they will say, well, insulin isn't a marker that matters. It is. And if you're measuring insulin resistance, just to put things back to where we had talked about it earlier, many people with insulin resistance have normal blood glucose levels. It's the insulin that's high. And so I would say if a person can get their insulin measured, get it measured. In U.S. units, if it is anything above about 10 microunits per mil, that's a warning. In U.K. units, if it's anything above about 40 picomoles, that's a warning. Insulin is high. You could have insulin resistance. 